afternoon, everyone. I am uh, very, very excited to be here today. The topic that we are really going to talk about is shown up here, CIOs and CMOs are powerful partnership. And this has really been prompted by a lot of questions that, that we've heard from a range of different people inside of this room, outside of this room, but also from the headlines. The headlines have talked about how CMOs are now spending more on technology than CIOs are. It's an interesting stat. I'm kind of curious what the room thinks about that. Um, we've heard that CMOs are driving more of the decisions, more of the choice of software vendors or the partners in the technology world than they ever have before. And so as we thought about this question, we decided to invite a couple of special guests here to join us today. Um, we will be joined by, my clicker does not work, but there we go. Alan Tegeson, who is the president of the Americas for Google, and Stefan Pretorius, who is the group CTO for WPP. So if you um, can please join me in welcoming uh, Alan and Stefan up on stage. All right, so thank you for joining us today. We're going to start with just a little bit of introduction. So maybe, Stefan, if you can, as you take your drink of water, you thought I was going in this direction as opposed to this one. Um, tell us a little bit about WPP, who you are, what your role is, um, and then we will take it from there. Great. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Stefan Pretorius. I'm the group CTO for WPP. We are the world's largest marketing services organization. Um, I'd, I'd guess that probably 75% of this room are clients of ours in some form or another. And we work across um, consumer insights, media buying and planning, advertising services, as well as marketing and advertising technology. So um, about a 35-year-old group um, with lots of iconic advertising and marketing brands in our group, like Ogilvy, Wonderman Thompson, Mindshare, Mediacom, Kantar. Um, we, we're typically known better for the components parts of our group as opposed to the, the holding company, but um, that is changing quite dramatically recently in terms of our culture. Terrific. Thank you. Alan, can you introduce yourself and your role within Google, please? Yes. So. Um, in addition to being in the cloud business, Google's also in the advertising business. We have a little tiny ad <laughs> you may have heard of. Um, and uh, I manage that business in the Americas. Um, so many of you probably use Google Search, and you've noticed that some of the results are ads. Um, we also have ads on YouTube, in mobile apps, on third-party websites, and my teams sell and uh, deploy those products to customers across North and South America. Yeah, it is a large business. Um, Google does over 120 billion or so in advertising revenue uh, worldwide, and about half of that is in the Americas. Um, so um, we have some say with the CMO suite, and and I think that's one of the reasons why we are so excited about the uh, the work that we're beginning to do with the Google Cloud team because it uh, it's it's the next frontier for our customers. Well, and I'm, I'm really excited that those of you who know all about Google Cloud but have never heard of the ads business and here now have the opportunity to be exposed <laughs> to that today. So mission accomplished. Um, but so bo both of you spend a lot of your time dealing with talking to CMOs and really hearing what's on their mind. Can we just start off by exploring the initial premise here, whether the premise is how important the partnership is between CIOs and CMOs or the more provocative one of CMOs are starting to spend more and more on IT than even in some cases the IT organization? Stefan. I mean, it, it, it's a funny question that, right? And I think it's sort of a, a construct that, that Accenture developed in order to create consulting opportunities between, you know, marketing and IT. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to be provocative, but it's the end of next. I'm a little <coughs> tired of the set pieces. Um, we, we, we decided that you've been in this room for two days. Yeah, there's no teleprompter. Provocative so and very, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. But, but in, in all seriousness, I mean, I think there's this idea that there's a CMO and CI, CIO divide in, is a bit of a myth. I mean, clearly today, m virtually all aspects of marketing and sales <clears throat> is technology driven. And so, you know, CMOs rely heavily on their CIO partners to deliver the capability, you know, in order to do marketing. But the, I think the, the more interesting question about that, that premise of CMOs spend more money on, on technology than CIOs is, the, is really the inherent definition of what it means to be a CMO. Mm -hmm. And related to that, what is the definition of marketing, right? So if you say that marketing is advertising and <clears throat> you need to spend money on ad tech and 
you know, data for targeting, then it's a narrow scope, right? If you think that marketing is all customer experience, which includes brand, advertising, retail experience, product design, service design, you know, <coughs> then it's the entire enterprise. Right. So, and, and I think this is sort of the, the thing that's really shifted in the last couple of years is that, um, you know, if you, if you ask five CMOs what their scope is, you will get five different answers. Because in every organization, I mean, think about your previous role at Caesars, right? You were head of technology and marketing. We have clients who are heads of digital brand commerce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, they're straddling multiple different business functions. So I think the, 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 the point is really that, that as the, the definition of marketing has moved away from these kind of narrow functions of consumer insights, advertising, acquisition, you know, brand management, CRM, to this more holistic view of marketing as customer experience. Um, the CMO becomes the curator or the kind of the, the, the custodian of end-to-end -end customer experience. And the CIO becomes the, the technology business partner that helps to deliver that in a more consistent way. So it's, it, I think it's a sort of the wrong discussion to have, you know, uh, who spends more, you know. Okay, panel's over, <laughs> we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but so just to, to build off of that though, Alan, you spend a lot of your time yep. talking to CMOs and hearing how they're thinking about this, uh, this evolution in their role, right? To have yep. more of a technology, more of a broader business focus. Well, what do you hear as top of mind for them? Right, so I think the, the biggest change is, I think to Stefan's point, that historically marketing has been a series of sort of heavily siloed activities that have been only modestly supported with IT. You know, so maybe people had an email app, an email uh, marketing application. Maybe they had some content management. Maybe they had some ad tech tools, and those were run by separate teams. There was no attempt at sharing data across those platforms. And the, uh, but perhaps even more profoundly, the business objectives of those teams were fairly narrow. So, you know, the, a marketing ads team might be worried about how many millions of consumers are they reaching with their ads, but they would not have a broader context for what business results they're trying to drive. And I think that, is, to me, is the biggest change mm -hmm. uh, for CMOs now, is that having been in many companies, not all, maybe a more junior member of the, of the executive suite, now being able to translate marketing directly into top and bottom line uh, results, enabled largely by digital advertising and marketing, uh, that changes their position in the C-suite. And then on top of that, I think what Stefan mentioned about defining the role more broadly, now that, that, that there's this possibility of having a single data repository that powers across all these different applications, as well as customer experience and digital extensions to the experience, that gives the CMO a more powerful position and opportunity to assert themselves. That said, you know, many of you are probably in organizations like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm not hearing from my CMO. What we're saying is, I think you will, and that they are the most, um, uh, I think, interesting partner for the CIO and the CTO to partner with to bring that single data repository to life because you're now talking to someone who can deliver not just efficiency, but top-level business results, which is a completely different conversation with the CFO and the CEO. So that's what we're trying to help CMOs do, yep. and I think that's why we're so excited about um, the work that we're doing with, with Tarek and team, because that is where the cutting edge of marketing is. And I think if you haven't heard from your CMO already, first of all, you should go talk to them, and you will very soon, because this is where marketing is going. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you, if, if CMOs are not leaning into that, they, they will be left behind. Can I just pile on on that? I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about that, that shift, right, from, from these kind of functionally siloed um, <coughs> business teams into more integrated, um, you know, functions, it really has kind of two big implications. The one, you know, the obvious one in terms of consumer experience is that if you have a more joined up view of how consumer experience is your brand in advertising, in retail, you know, using the product or using the service directly, the consumer experience becomes better. Um, which means they become more loyal, they spend more money with you, your business grows better. So there's a, there's a, a very big kind of um, growth objective with that, um, yep. with that strategy. But the, but the technical implication of that, of that imperative, and this is kind of important for all the CIOs in this room, is that the only way you can make good decisions about what to invest in, yep. do you spend more money on advertising? You know, yep. like, pardon the, um, the, the disloyalty, but I mean, do you spend less money on Google search and more money on yep. YouTube? Exactly. 
I got it, Ryan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, or do you spend more money on, on packaging? Do you spend more, more money on refitting your stores? Do you spend more money on innovating new products? Those decisions are very difficult sure. to make and have been very difficult to make historically because the data wasn't available to make those decisions in one, in so one analytical exercise. Now, the point is that as, as cloud becomes more pervasive in marketing and you are able technically to combine your advertising data, your CRM data, your ERP data, your supply chain data, and all kinds of market dynamic data that, that, ne that you need to make decisions, CMOs are now better equipped to make those decisions about what to invest in, yep. what to prioritize, um, and, where to, and where to focus. Uh, it, frankly, in the past, it was an impossible job. Right? Yeah. And, and I think the, it's, the, it's really the job of the CIOs to help CMOs um, uh, you know, prepare their kind of technology and data environments to make those decisions more, uh, more effectively. Well, and so uh, on this point, though, core to this partnership that you're talking about, a core to the role that the CMO and CIO can play together is your data strategy and how you think about your data. And one of the things that is very clear, whether it's because of GDPR or any number of different regulatory changes, consumer expectation changes, is that you have to be really thoughtful, uh, particularly when you're dealing with customer data, about your data strategy, your first party data, your third party data. So, Alan, maybe we can start with you. Yep. How do you think about how people should approach the question of their data strategy? Yeah, so I think that's pretty much the first question I get from most of our large There's clients. The third one here. Yeah, well, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> so I, I think the um, couple of points I'd make. One is um, many CMOs and their colleagues in the C-suite realize that the splintered, siloed data sets that they currently have are impeding their ability to operate you know, with greater uh, scale, efficiency, and agility. And so that's very much on their mind. They're just not sure how to get there. And so that leads into a discussion about trying to get your data in the cloud, get it on a consistent basis, get it cleansed. Um, that, so that's, I think, topic number one, and how important that is. Topic number two is identifying some of the early wins, so key applications where you can extract value immediately. Nobody wants to do projects just, you know, that are just plumbing without seeing some business results in the back uh, um, relatively early. And so we, we look for opportunities where there can be a transformative impact on customer experience or a transformative impact on advertising efficiency or a transformative impact on seller and distribution channel um, economics. Um, third, I'd say the whole specter of regulation and consumer concern around data is typically a topic that comes up a lot. And areas there, I think, first, um, I think the world is increasingly going to, you'll have our large clients with their own first party data, and then you'll have a few platforms with very strong first party data about consumers, and the great opportunities will arise as you join those two data sets. Yeah. And th there, there's not tremendous opportunity outside of those two, but, th but you need to have the, the, those two pieces complement each other very well. And so we're trying to get our clients to a place where they can capitalize on that. Um, what we hear, of course, is you know one one concern that comes up. Well, well, if I put all my data in the cloud, are you going to use it, or I'm, is it going to leak, or is Google going to use it for advertising? And that's clearly not the case. If you're you're just buying regular uh, cloud services from us, we have no ability to look at that in any way. If you choose to engage with our advertising and marketing teams, and you want to find ways, we have a very s we have some very secure ways of allowing. Uh, us to join your first party data with ours in a double blind cloud hosted privacy environment, safe. privacy safe environment that I think is really the architecture for data sharing going forward. Um, and so that's a, a topic that we explore a lot right. with, with uh, the CMOs. You know, well, I, I think one of the things that I am often struck by in this, in this conversation is how much focus there is on third party data. How do I get access to yeah. more third party data? What can I do to get? Google to share their data with me, et cetera. And, and I find a less of an emphasis on your first party data, but incredible value that can actually come from breaking down the data silos you have within your own organization. And this is the topic we were just talking about backstage with yep. some of the insights that you shared I thought would be very helpful for the audience here. Yeah, I mean, I think first party data is, is, a, um, is clearly um, of, of much higher fidelity and, and, and much higher indication of, of where, um, you know, what 
what you need to make decisions on in terms of marketing and advertising. And, and you know, the market has focused a lot on third-party data uh, over past years, but the, the fidelity of that data and the usefulness of that data is sometimes very questionable. So I think the increasingly this, this, um, this model that Alan was talking about in terms of companies building up significant uh, first-party data sets so they can then um, understand how that relates to other ecosystems, um, whether it be in Google or in Amazon or any other kind of, um, you know, of the, the kind of marketing or media platforms, is, is really kind of the future model. Um, the thing I would say, though, about, about first-party data is that, you know, first-party data is not just, you know, names, demographics, you know, income levels, things like that. Um, you know, I think the many companies probably realize that there's an enormous amount of enterprise data and um, ecosystem data that's enormously interesting for marketing that's often overlooked by, by marketers. You know, if you're a, a manufacturer of flu medication, the only thing that matters in terms of marketing is when there are flu outbreaks. Yeah. And being able to predict when flu is breaking out, where, in which city, in which country, and being able to respond quickly to that and get your products and your promotions in market, that's all that matters. Everyone's going to buy it. You know, um, it doesn't matter whether, you know, there were women 25 to 35 or, a, you know, a man, you know, earning $200,000 a year. Those, those are far less important signals for your marketing yeah. efforts. Yeah. So I think the, the, you know, this kind of expanse, more expansive view of what first party data is, is really important to focus on. Um, the other thing I would say is that many people assume that their first party data is um, irre irrevocable. Um, it's data that they'll always have and that they own or have a right to. Um, regulation changes those things very quickly, and technology changes those things very quickly. You know, already today, if you think about the, the usefulness of a cookie, um, if you, most of our clients, in terms of their, their kind of, you know, digital marketing or addressable, you know, media and marketing spend, spend approximately 50% on paid search, 30% on paid social, and about 20% on, on targeted display. Now, cookies are only useful for 20% of your addressable spend, therefore. Right. And that's happened in the last five years. So, you know, I think, I think this notion that, that, you know, there are data sets which are um, first-party data, something you always have access to, that you somehow own, um, that changes through market dynamics, but then also through regulation. Um, the European situation is very different from the US, and frankly, I think most companies should start to, to, to work on models that can accommodate the highest level of regulatory um, scrutiny, not the lowest common denominator. Uh, you know, particularly global companies that have to operate in a consistent way across the world. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe so, w one of the, a as you talk about some of these challenges and how you see the role of data analytics yep. feeding into marketing, you know, it, it strikes me that the definition you even used for WPP, what business are you in, is a marketing services company as opposed to an agency, right? Which is how <laughs> marketers of old would have <laughs> thought about WPP, or at least the companies, Ogilvy, et cetera, uh, underneath. And, and frankly, you see GSIs and others in the room who come from the IT world who are starting to be get into the marketing services mm -hmm. world as well. So how do you see the evolution of, of your business and the role that cloud is playing in that? I mean, I, th I think increasingly we're talking about ourselves as a creative transformation company. Um, you know, creativity is our ability to solve problems for our clients. It's our ability to connect our client clients' brands with culture, to make them more relevant, to make consumers <coughs> understand and change behavior. And the, the transformation part of it is really what all our clients are asking us to help them with, which is apply technology to our business and to the practice of marketing in order to help them grow um, faster and more effectively. And, and really, you know, we, we combine a number of different things in order to achieve that. So, you know, very, very powerful consumer insights across, you know, brands, markets, uh, products, consumption patterns, transactions, all the way through to, you know, the, uh, the creation of beautiful content and ideas um, that bring brands to life, all the way through to activating that in media um, and CRM programs, and then also the application of technology, you know, acting as an SI, um, implementing marketing and advertising technology for our clients. So it's a very wide range of, of services that we offer. And, you know, to Alan's earlier point about the fragmentation of our industry, WPP grew up through an M&A strategy. It's a business that's 35 years old that was entirely funded on or, f or sort of founded on this concept of acquiring specialist skill sets and con putting it in the conglomerate. And, you know, 
what, what that doesn't take a genius to understand that what that creates is, is a lot of pockets of very siloed capability, sure. um, both in terms of talent, but also in terms of data assets, applications, et cetera. So the, the job that myself and my team now have is to effectively create more value for WPP and accelerate our growth by making the best data sets available to everyone, making the best applications available to everyone in the group, and cloud is the only way to make that happen. So in a very profound way, um, you know, cloud is the only way that we can drive our transformation, our own transformation. And cloud is the only way that we can deliver this kind of, you know, mantra of being open, optimistic, and extraordinary, which is sort of our new cultural statement, um, and, and to do, you know, to work with our clients in that way. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to connect our data to our clients' data. We need to be able to expose our applications to our clients for transparency and for, you know, kind of uh, solution delivery. So it, it is an absolutely strategic relationship for us and, um, and you know, key to our transformation. So, uh, Alan, a lot of what Thomas talked about today and yesterday on, on stage and a lot of what PH was just talking about right now is the digital transformation journey yep. and the role of culture and the role of technology and, and new capabilities. And, yep. and we've been approaching this from a, a cloud-first standpoint. I'm sort of curious, being inside of Google but taking a different lens on it, how you see Google being able to help everyone here with their digital transformation journey. What, what would your advice be? Yeah. Um, well, I think that, that uh, PH made a very good point in his closing remarks that um, it's, it's partly about the technology, and I think we, we have a lot to offer there, but it's just a, as much about the cultural mm -hmm. transformation. In fact, what I observe with most of our clients mm -hmm. is that what's holding them back is typically not access to technology, but it is the incentive systems and organizational structures and culture and thought processes that exist that prevent them from reimagining their business in ways that would be transformative. Um, and I think that is something that, um, I, I think we, 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 can, we can help with that, um, both coming at it from the, from the marketing and ad side and coming at it from the cloud side. And I think that is a, that's, that's one I would highlight. I think the, the, one of the places that I find that the marketing teams need to start is is how are people measured? How is success measured? Mm -hmm. um, I think that is, it's, it's, you know, you, you can look at what organizations value and you can see why people behave the way they do based on how they're evaluated and how, how um, what metrics the organization values. Mm -hmm. And that would be one of the first places I would look for all of you that want to be at the forefront of organizational transformation is thinking about you can't personally go and persuade everybody. It doesn't work, right? Um, and even if your CEO is with you and says it, it still doesn't work. You need to change people one at a time, and the best place to do that, I think, is through uh, performance management and incentives. And so that's a big area that we focus on. So in the marketing realm, what that means, for example, is get the, the team that's been working on e-commerce, and the, we take a big retailer, the team's working on e-commerce, the team's been working on stores, and are comped only on their own channel to start being comped on the whole so that everybody sees that if I run an online ad and it gets more people in the store, that, that I benefit from that. Literally, right now, most retailers don't operate that way. Um, so you change that, it has transformative effect. Great. So we are going to, there's a folks who are going to appear with microphones and what have you. We're going to take any questions that you may have in the audience just while everyone gets set up. I think one. Final question, Stefan, for you. You've recently made the decision to move more aggressively in the cloud, go with Google Cloud. You talk about, uh, and a lot of the reason is because of the synergy between the CTO or CIO hat and the CMO hat. Can you talk a little bit about the, the, the advantages you were looking for there? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, there, there's a, there are a couple of ways to, to approach that. And I, I think the, the one is that you know, there's clearly a kind of a very strong relationship between Google and WPP, right? I mean, we, we your largest customer on the ad side globally. Um, we are your media agency, so we help you market your own products. Um, and many of our teams have, have adopted you know, Google Cloud technologies for various um, CRM or other kind of media optimization technologies in the past years. So you know, it made a lot of sense for us to, you know, from a relationship and an ecosystem perspective. But I think the, you know, the thing also to think about is that 
and, and for those of you who work um, with your CMOs, it's worthwhile keeping these, these elements in, in, uh, in mind. The, the, the variety of the data that one has to deal with in, in marketing is, is actually quite enormous. So on the one hand, you know, on our ad tech part of the world, we have to manage enormous volumes of, of high response um, you know, kind of workloads, sort of four millisecond response um, key value pair data stores that we have to you know, have available globally. And you know, Google can do that because Google has a great heritage in building that and cloud you know, enables those kinds of um, results through things like Bigtable and Query and so on. So, so that's the one. The one that the, the second one is that we, on the other hand, um, we do customer data management for clients in the the healthcare and the health insurance um, space, where you know we we have legacy um, applications that store you know up to 20, 25 pet petabytes of customer data in a highly highly secure, privacy safe you know kind of environment that has to be HIPAA and HITRUST compliant. Um, that's an entirely different kind of, 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 you know, sort of technology requirement. And then at the same time, you have this kind of thing in the middle where, you know, we have to deal with enormous volumes of content, videos, images, et cetera, that has to be indexed, has to be understood at scale. And, and again, that's a different workload, right? It's sort of more, more of a kind of an AI type workload, but also enormously, um, you know, sort of onerous on storage and, and, and compute. So, you know, I think, I think the, the, when, when looking at a cloud partner, it's really important to kind of to consider all the different, the extremes of the different workloads and different kind of software requirements in a way that, that uh, and, and make a decision on whether that is, that is um, appropriate for you. Great. So if there's any questions, please uh, raise your hand. I think just to close, if there are no questions, I want to, Chris, uh, the, in the previous presentation, made a point about co-locating business people with the engineering folks, right? And really saying, how do you actually innovate by bringing these teams closer together? And just from each of your vantage points, would love to hear what you think is the biggest gotcha, the biggest thing that you've seen that people in this room should watch out for as, we, as they start thinking about deepening that, that tie, that, that connection. And Alan, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think it comes back to the theme that I touched on earlier, that you can't be building technology for technology's sake. You have to translate it into <coughs> one or two applications that are that can be understood and deployed. And I think those are those need to be co-developed by people who understand the technology and the business front line. Um, and I think the the more you can picture those early use cases and drive them to completion and have clear understanding, uh, ideally quantitative mm -hmm. performance objectives for for those trials, the better. I mean, the more you can get into sort of a launch and iterate type of mode, as opposed to the big, in two years, we're gonna have everything, uh, the uh, the more likely I think you are to be successful. Great. Yeah, I would say the, the you know, there's always a temptation when, <coughs> when you've got a very federated environment with lots of, of um, complexity, for people to want to centralize things and people to want to own things and put a dedicated team on it and then build stuff that they then deploy to the masses, right? And uh, I think, I think that's, that's probably the biggest mistake that anyone could make today. Um, Is over-centralizing. Com yeah. Completely, I mean, and, 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 the, and especially in professional service organizations where you, you know, the value of what we generate is effectively the interpretation of an idea or a requirement that, that can only exist in front of the client. Right? So the, the most productive space, innovation space for us is where we have you know, very close, intimate relationships with clients, grappling with clients about what their problems are and you know, understanding their category and how we, how we you know, help them grow and, and market their products. Um, and we have technically savvy uh, practitioners who are innovating how they operate every day in order to meet those demands. So, and that is a completely decentralized um, strategy. And so, you know, the, the trick in terms of, of adopting cloud is to provide the platforms, the standards, the ecosystems where that, that kind of, you know, innovation at the coal face can be, you know, encouraged and accelerated and then productized into kind of, you know, more, more kind of, um, you know, multi-featured multi kind of SaaS solutions. But if we lose that kind of innovation at the, at the edge, our business will die. Yeah. And I think there's, an, you know, there's sort of an interesting historical moment where we're going in that direction and the, virtually the entire rest of our industry is going the opposite direction because they're under pressure. We're all under pressure um, in order to innovate the business, but there's, sort of, you know, there's a moment in time where WPP is taking a, a radically different approach from our competitors. And I've, it'll be fascinating to sit here in three years' time and you know, see what 
what the, what's I like your chance what to respond. I think it's very smart. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's only and, and just to, just to close with well, one of the things that we are seeing quite a bit is what one of the advantages of cloud and access controls and APIs and what have you is that you can create a single version of the truth from a data standpoint. As an example, you can create these platforms, but then unleash innovation in other places. And a lot of the partners and customers we work with really find that the adoption of data science, AI, et cetera, is actually sped up dramatically by having a centralized platform, but a decentralized approach to That's innovation. That's exactly right, yep. absolutely. Terrific. Well, if you could all join me in thanking uh, Stefan and Alan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And I think